was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind away It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing when I Alive On my face Out of the darkness into your glorious day, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. My soul Now you freedom is all I know The old man knew Since when I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Fails, it will 
Father, we thank you so much. You're so wonderful and mighty and great. You're so powerful to rescue and so powerful to save. And you're so merciful to forgive and carry our sins, Lord, and our burdens. Father, we thank you so much and we praise you. We praise you whether we're in the valley or in the high in the mountaintop. God, we praise you whether we are rejoicing or whether we are mourning. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do, God. Continue to be with us. Continue to guide us and see us through this time. And remind us how good you are, how wonderful, how mighty and powerful you are. Thank you, God Almighty, for your love, your grace, your mercy. And above all, your goodness, God. We thank you so much and we praise and we worship you in Jesus' name. Good day, mate. I'm here to put a little shrimp on the bobby. Actually, I'm uh, here with my handy dandy barbie pole. It's caught quite a few bass for my daughter, but uh, here to uh, do a little demonstration for you guys this morning. We're uh, down here at the lake and we're getting a little hungry, so we're wanting to catch some food, maybe hoping to get a little turtle soup or some fish or maybe some duck. You never know what might be biting. But uh, just wanted to show you guys how you might help yourself catch a little fish. So a fisherman is always looking to deceive the fish because the fish has to bite the hook, has to get it in its mouth in order to hook it to get it out of the water because they're quick and slimy and they're hard to catch by hand. And so if he can get it to bite on something with the hook with a string attached, he can reel them in and catch the fish. But sometimes, you have to chum the water a little bit to get them going. So that's what we're going to do this morning and see what happens. So I've got here some bread and I've got some apples and we're going to see what happens when we start chumming the waters out here. So we start tossing in a little bread. Nothing. Nothing. Oh, something. Something came up and grabbed that bread. Can you see the fish? May have to pan in a little closer. Here they come. They're coming in and getting a free meal, aren't they? Look at that. Free food, free food for all. Come and get it. Come and get it, everybody. If you can't see in the water, there's little sunfish or bluegill or crappie coming up and grabbing that, that bread. Other fish are hearing the news. Well, news travels fast in the water. And here they come. Oh, here come some other friends. Some turtles. I got some apples. Let's see how they like those. Oh, turtles are chowing on those. Yeah, they're loving that. Here they come. We got a whole feeding frenzy out here. We got apples for everybody. Come and get it, everybody. Come and get it. Free food. Free food. Now you see how quickly they're all coming. All trying to enjoy a free meal. Fish are a little weary because they don't want to get eaten by a turtle. But they're still coming for the free food. So you see all this free food out there. Now what if I was to take advantage of all this free food? What if I wanted to make food out of one of those fish or out of one of those turtles? What I would do is I would take some bread and I would conceal my hook within the bread. When a feeding frenzy is started like that, at first they're, they're a little weary 
but then they see the free food and they begin to eat it. Then I put in the hook, toss it out there, and what do you think is going to happen? Yep. A fish that has let its guard down will bite onto that bread and will get hooked. They won't see the string that is attached. When there are strings attached, you need to be careful and you need to be cautious. God's Word warns us of that. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 23. In Proverbs chapter 3, Solomon is continuing his study of sayings of the wise. It says, when you sit to dine with a ruler, note well what is before you, and put a knife to your throat if you're given to gluttony. Do not crave his delicacies, for that food is deceptive. Turn back to the beginning of that. When you sit to dine with a ruler, someone who's in charge, someone's authority, someone who's in charge of people, note well what is before you. My Bible has a little A above it. The connotation means that you can also put in or who. So know well who is before you. What is before you and who is before you. I would say consider both. Food can be a deceptive thing. People can invite you over for dinner and have a ulterior motive, can't they? They're trying to butter you up. They're trying to get you to commit to something. Be cautious. If you know a ruler and you know their heart and you know that they are not a kind or nice person, but they're being kind to you, what is their intent and what is their motive? Solomon says, put a knife to your throat if you're given to gluttony. Don't indulge in it and don't eat more than you're supposed to. He warns us over and over again to be careful not to eat too much when you're invited over to somebody's house because someone is noting how much it costs. You need to note the person in the heart and be discerning of the heart of people who are offering you a free meal. Did I offer the meal to the turtles and the fish out of a kind heart because I wanted to care for them and wanted to love them and just wanted to see them? Or did I have an ulterior motive to eat them? This is what Solomon is saying be careful of. So discern the heart of the one offering. You need to look for the hook. What is the hook? What is the motive? Is there a string attached to what they're offering? Be very careful because they're fishing. And so be cautious when you're invited to someone's house to eat, when they invite you over to do something. Not in the sense of being, being never going over because everybody's got that intent. Not everybody does. But be discerning of the heart of the person that is asking you. And if you know that their heart is deceitful and wicked, then be very cautious. Maybe don't go, maybe don't, don't indulge in that, but be very cautious of what they might be asking for. God's word is incredibly wise and his, his sayings here in Proverbs <clears throat> can help you in life. Moving on to chapter, to verse four, do not wear yourself out to get rich. Do not trust your own cleverness. Cast but a glance at riches and they are gone. For they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Riches Solomon warns about. Why? He was the richest man in the world. At that time, he was the richest man in the world. Had everything money could buy. But it didn't get him happiness. Riches are fleeting. And they do not provide what you think they will provide. So don't wear yourselves out to get rich. Sure, work to make money and be diligent about your work, but don't do it just for the sake of money. It'll disappoint you. Verse six says, do not eat the food of a begrudging host. Do not crave his delicacies, for he is the kind of person who is always thinking about the cost. Eat, drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up what little you have eaten 
and you will have wasted your compliments. A begrudging host is doing it for wrong motives or wrong reasons, but is always looking at the cost. So be cautious when your boss invites you over to eat. Don't overeat, don't indulge, don't go to a wedding and, and feast on the food and, and drink as much as you can and, and all that. There's somebody who is counting the cost and they'll despise you in their heart if you're doing that. So be very careful when you are invited out to eat. If it's a friend, a trusted friend, hey, no, no worries, no problem. But if it's someone that you know has shown themselves to be a person with wrong intent and wrong motive and wrong heart, don't be gullible. Be wise in how you handle yourself. Do not speak to fools, for they will scorn your prudent words. This is important. There's also a scripture in the Bible that says, do not cast your pearls before swine. In other words, don't waste wisdom on people that won't listen and won't heed that. Be very cautious. Let your words be given and your wisdom be given to those who are hungry for it and will, will treat that, that wisdom well. Verse 10 says, Do not move an ancient boundary stone or encroach on the fields of the fatherless, for the defender is strong. He will take up their case against you. The fatherless. The Bible says that God is a father to the fatherless. So if you encroach on the fields of the fatherless or you take something from someone who doesn't have a father or a defender, be very careful because who is their defender? God is. And you do not want to have God against you. And so be very cautious and make sure you care for them and defend them as well because that's God's heart is to defend those who have no defender. Verse 12, apply your heart to instruction and your ears to words of knowledge. Apply your heart. What does that mean to apply? To put your heart intent on it. To put your heart's desire on it. With everything you've got, just like you did when you were pursuing a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Put your heart's intent into it, your heart's desire into it. If you apply your heart to instruction and your ears to words of knowledge, you will gain much wisdom. This is important for us to be able to teach our children and teach our youth that we give them this knowledge and this hunger and this heart towards instruction and knowledge. It will preserve their life and it will bless them. And so, young people, I encourage you, if you're struggling with school and you'd much rather play or do something else besides school when it's time for school, it's not wrong to play. It's not wrong to love those things and to have fun with that. But when it's time to learn, apply your heart to it. Get all that you can. Who's it going to bless? It's going to end up blessing you. And it's going to benefit your life later on. Verse 13. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with the rod, they will not die. Punish them with the rod and save them from death. Parents understand and know that discipline is not fun to give. But you will preserve the life of your children if you discipline them. If you withhold discipline because you just don't have the desire to do it and you're, wear, you're wore out or you don't want to do it, you are actually hurting your children and getting them closer to destruction than you are to helping them. Discipline is definitely needed. Verse 15, my son, if, if your heart is wise, then my heart will be glad indeed. My inmost being will rejoice when your lips speak what is right. Here, Solomon is addressing his son and probably addressing us, that when your heart is wise, when you're making good choices, when your children make good choices, it blesses the parent. It shows them that, that they have done a good job and that, that their children are going to do well in life. When children are making wrong decisions and they're doing wrong things, the parents' hearts are broken and they, they're, they're destroyed inside because what they're investing in and what they're trying to develop is being destroyed. And so Solomon here says, my son, if your heart is wise, then my heart will be glad indeed. 
when you see a, a prudent son or you see a prudent daughter, one that's doing well and doing right with what they're doing, their parents are proud of them. And it blesses the parent. And so children, if you want to bless your parents, be wise and gain wisdom. Verse 17, do not let your heart envy sinners, but always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. There is surely a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. Envying sinners in your heart. Here Solomon again addresses the heart issue. What is going on in your heart? Don't let your heart envy sinners and what they're doing and the things that they have. What they have is temporal. The things that they've gained out of their wickedness or their sin, it's going to go away. There will come a time of judgment. There will come a time of punishment for those things. And you don't want to let your heart envy that because you will end up replicating that. And then you will have the same end as them. So be zealous for the fear of the Lord. And what is the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? And we talked about this. The fear of the Lord is humility. It's understanding who you are before God and who God is. And so be zealous for those things. There is surely a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. The future hope we have is an eternal life with, with Jesus, an eternal life in heaven. That is the future hope. But there is also hope with the wisdom even in this world, when you can use that wisdom, and that wisdom comes back to bless your life. Verse 19, Listen, my son, and be wise. Set your heart on the right path. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. For drunk, drunkards and gluttons become poor, and drowsiness clothes them in rags. Here again, addressing his son, or you and I as sons, and saying, set your heart on the right path. Make sure that you're looking to put your heart in the right direction, on the right path, and don't join those that are drink too much and gorge themselves on meat because poverty comes after that. Verse 22, Listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Wisdom, instruction, and insight as well. Listen to your mom and your dad. Don't despise them, but listen to them. They've lived life before you. They've learned a thing or two. But then it says to buy truth and do not sell it. Wisdom, instruction, and insight as well. Get all of this learning that you can. Don't despise it. I know when I was young, I didn't want to go to school. I didn't want to be there. I just wanted to get out and play and to have fun. And that's all I wanted to do. And I couldn't wait to get out of school. I never learned to love truth until I got older. And when I got older, I learned that truth blessed me. Truth helped me. Knowledge and experience, all these things provided and profited my life. But I didn't understand this as a young man. And I didn't understand it as a child. If you can glean this as a child, you kids that are listening, if you can get understanding and you can get these things, it's going to bless you. Because did you know that all of you will one day be 50, be 40, be 30? All of you one day will maybe be a mom or a dad. Maybe have a job. Maybe have a, or want a house or a car or a boat or this or that. You want things in life. If you shirk wisdom and you shirk knowledge and you push it off and you don't want it, who's going to hire you? Very few people hire fools. But a lot of people hire wise people and people with knowledge and understanding and insight. And so if you can glean those things, people will want to hire you and they'll want to pay you good money for the services that you can provide. And so seek after those things. It will bless your life and it will protect your life also. So not only will it help you financially, but it will protect you from going in wrong directions and doing foolish things and losing the money that you've made. And it will bless your life. Verse 24 says, The father of a righteous child has great joy. A man whose father, who fathers a wise son rejoices in him. May your father and mother rejoice. May she who gave you birth be joyful. Here he pronounces a blessing. And he says, May your father and mother rejoice, and may she who gave you birth be joyful. This blessing that comes from having children 
who fear God, who love God, and make good choices. So children, bless your parents. And one way you can return that blessing is to live righteous and to do the right thing. So avoid wickedness. Verse 26, My son, give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my ways. For an adulterous woman is a deep pit and a wayward wife is a narrow well. Like a bandit, she lies in wait and multiplies the unfaithful among men. The first part of this verse is very important. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my ways. Here Solomon is tying the eyes and the what? The heart. The eyes and the heart. We've talked about this before. The eyes are the gate. Right? The eyes are the gate to the heart. Your eyes and your ears, the things you listen to, the things you see, the things you look at, you end up wanting, right? Over and over again, I see an ad on Facebook or I see an ad on TV and I see something I've never seen before and I want it. Oh, that'd be cool. Just this morning, I saw this cool tool apron that you pull over top, has suspended or whatever, and it drapes down over top of you and doesn't have to sit on your belt and you just put it on. It was a cool tool belt. Never seen one before. But now that I saw it, I want one. I even showed it to my wife. Oh, isn't this cool? Look at this. And then in my heart, what do I want? That tool belt. I wanted that, that apron to be able to put my tools in and all that stuff and have them right there. That happens with cars, happens with houses, happens with jewelry, happens with people. Be careful what your eyes see. Know that the enemy is out there fishing putting that little temptation right in front of you. He knows if your eyes see it, oh, you're gonna want it, okay? But don't be fooled by the shiny distraction. Look for the hook. Are there strings attached? If there are, be very careful. So be cautious what your eye catches and what your eye sees. Ask God to put an eye, a guard on your eye. Job wisely said, I made a covenant with my eye not to look lustfully on a woman. And what did Jesus say later? If you so much as look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery with her. Because it's the look, it's the eye, it's the catching in and it's the changing of the heart. The heart is the whole issue. You know, sometimes you can do the right thing and never do the wrong thing, but you can be wanting to in your heart. You can be considering it and contemplating it in your heart. So where does the sin actually lie? Right in the heart. Where does it come in at? Through the eye. So be very careful. Kids, learn to guard your eye. Learn to turn away from evil. Learn to turn off the TV or to not look at those things on Facebook or on the internet. Turn your eye away from evil and the hunger inside your heart to do evil will subside. When you begin to look at those things, your heart begins to hunger for them. Your heart is just responsive to what your eye is putting in there. So this needs to be guarded. This needs to be guarded. Be careful who you're listening to. Who are your friends in life? Are your friends speaking good things in your life? Are they speaking deceitful, evil things and, and trying to get you to do devious things? Be cautious and be careful because they'll lead you in a wrong direction. What you allow in your ear from your friends' conversations and from your friends' uh, instructions, they'll get into your heart and pretty soon you'll be desiring it. Be careful what you watch and what you look at. Solomon is very wise here. He says, be cautious and be careful. Verse 29, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. Do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights and your mind will imagine confusing things. You will be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the rigging. 
Can you imagine a boat swinging back and forth in the high seas? They hit me, you say, but I am not hurt. They beat me, but I do not feel it. When I wake up, or when will I wake up so I can have another drink? Solomon says, who has woe, sorrow, strife, complaints, needless bruises, bloodshot eyes? He's here giving you a verbal picture similar to the visual picture I gave you this morning of fishing and, and, and chumming and throwing out bait. He's here giving you a verbal picture of what it means to be controlled by alcohol. Now to drink alcohol, to have a drink, is not a sin. But to be given to drunkenness is. Now, can you have a drink and it be sin? Absolutely. You say, well, how does that? If you cause someone to stumble because of your freedom, it's sin. Paul clearly says, don't let your, your, your uh, allowances, the things that God allows you to do, to stumble somebody else. And so the best thing is, is to not to drink. But you can't say that it is a sin to drink because it is not a sin to drink. Jesus ate and drank with sinners and he made wine. So it's not a sin to drink, but it can be if you're causing someone to stumble. So don't cause someone to stumble. If you know someone's an alcoholic or they've struggled with that in their life, don't take them out and offer them a drink and don't have one in front of them so as to stumble them. But be very cautious with alcohol. Don't look at the wine. Don't get your heart after it because what your eye sees, your heart what? Wants. Jesus was not given to alcohol. When you're given to it, it means you're addicted to it. You can't, you can't get away from it. It does have an addictive quality to it, so it needs to be taken cautiously and carefully. I would recommend praying before you ever do so. Why? Because you could be in a situation where you look around and there's no one else around that, that, that uh, has an issue with alcohol and you're out drinking and you want to have a drink and so you order a drink and you're sitting there in the window and someone walks walks by that doesn't have the knowledge or understanding of the Bible and all that and they think that drinking is wrong and they've been told that it's a sin when it's not and they, they walk by and see you doing it and you've just stumbled them unintentionally. However, if you pray about it and God says, yeah, you can or no, you can't, then, then obviously you obey the Lord. And so walking with God in those decisions, especially with those, those areas that we consider like gray areas, those difficult areas, those areas that could lead you into a wrong direction, be cautious with them. Always better to err on the side of caution. But Jesus, it says that he made no decision on own. Every decision he made, he made because God directed him. And he ate and he drank with sinners. He made wine. He was directed. He was guided. He was, he was obedient to the Father. He did nothing of his own accord, the Word of God says. That means he didn't make his own decisions. And then if we are to follow in his footsteps, should we be making our own decisions? We have the ability to, but if we have given that over to the Lord, he is now our Lord. He is our master. We are his servants. And so we need to be obedient to him. And so we should place that before our master and say, Lord, do you want me to or do you not want me to? And this, this helps you to navigate that where you can't navigate it on your own because you don't know who's watching or what they're thinking or what their heart condition is. It will help you in those instances. And so pray before doing something like that. It's very important that we walk in obedience as Jesus did. In summary of this chapter, the Word of God says to guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. It is always about the heart, isn't it? The heart issue. You know, in court, lawyers all try to pin it on truth or try to catch you and try to do this or that and sometimes people get off that are actually guilty because they could not be proven guilty the heart the bible says is deceitfully wicked above all things who can know it the heart is a key element to our life it is very important if you would turn to exodus 28 29 through 30 Exodus, back in the Old Testament. 
I want to show you something. We'll start in verse 6, so you kind of understand the context of what's being said here. Here are commands and, and descriptions of what, they're, what Moses is to make. And it says, Make an ephod, which is an outer garment, of gold and of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and of finely twisted linen, the work of skilled hands. So that's not to be just thrown together. This is supposed to be something that's very skillfully done, with intent, with hard work and purpose to this. It is to have two shoulder pieces attached to two of its corners so that it can be fastened. Its skillfully woven waistband, more skill put into this, more care, is to be like it, of one piece with the ephod and made of gold and with purple, or blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and to be finely twisted linen. Take two onyx stones, which are very precious, and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Who are the sons of Israel? All the twelve tribes. And they were loved by God. They were God's people. In the order of their birth, six names on one stone and the remaining six on the other. Engrave the names on the, of the sons of God on the two stones the way a gem cutter engraves a seal. And so this was to be done skillfully. This would be done with care. It was to be precious. Then mount the stones of gold, uh, fig, figury settings, and fasten them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. Aaron is to bear the names on his shoulders as a memorial before the, before the Lord. Make gold filigree settings and two braided chains of pure gold like a rope and attach the chains to the settings. Now here's the breast piece. The breast piece obviously is over the chest, over the heart. Fashion a breast piece for making decisions. Making decisions. Where your decisions come from? Usually because of a heart's desire, aren't they? So all these decisions that you're making are usually because they're heart-based, aren't they? What does my heart long for? What does it want in life? What do I want to do? What do I want to be? Who do I want to marry? Who, where do I want to work? All those things. The wanting comes from a longing in the heart, right? So you have this longing in your heart. And so it says, fashion a breast piece for making decisions. The work of skilled hands. Make, the, make like the ephod of gold and of blue, purple, scarlet yarn, and finely twisted linen. So it's to be skillfully done. It's to be skillfully and intently done, this guarding of your, of your heart. It is to be square, a span long and a span wide, and folded double. Then mount four rows of precious stones on it. The first row shall be of carnelian, chrysolite, and beryl. The second row shall be turquoise, lapis, lazuli, and emerald. The third row shall be jacinth, agate, agate, and amethyst. The fourth row should be topaz, onyx, and jasper. Mount them in gold filigree settings. There are to be twelve stones, one for each of the names of the sons of Israel. So these are God's people. Engraved like a seal with the name of one of the twelve tribes of Israel. For the breast piece, make braided chains of pure gold like a rope. Make two gold rings for it and fasten them in two corners to the breast piece. Fasten the two gold chains to the rings at the corner of the breast piece and the other ends at the chains of the two settings. Attach them to the shoulder pieces of the ephod at the front. Make two gold rings and attach them to the other two corners of the breast piece on the inside edge next to the ephod. Make two more gold rings and attach them at the bottom of the shoulder pieces on the front of the ephod close to the seam just above the waistband of the ephod. The rings of the breast piece are to be tied to the rings of the ephod with blue cord, connecting it to the waistband so that the breast piece will not swing away from the ephod. In other words, God's saying attach these things so that they will not swing away. God is wanting us to attach his truth. He's wanting us to attach these purity things, these, these pure gold, these, these things of purity to our heart. And he wants us to attach them to our heart so that it will not swing away, so that it will be covered, so that our heart will be pure, so that our heart can do the right thing. And so we want to take God's word and we want to attach it to our heart. The Bible says in one place, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. The priest had to have a pure heart and he had to go before in the presence of the Lord and he had to have a pure heart. If he had sin within his heart, 
he would be struck down dead and die and they would have to drag him out by a rope. They would put bells on him so that they could hear him walking around in the Holy of Holies because if he walked in with sin in his heart, God would strike him dead and they would have to drag him out of there. And so it was very serious that we come before God with a pure heart. And so attaching these things was important. Attaching these over as symbolic and it's important for us to be able to see these things. It says, whenever Aaron enters the holy place, he will bear the names of the son of Israel over his heart on the breast piece of decision. You hear that? The breast piece of decision. Where are your decisions made? They're made in your heart. As a continuing memorial before the Lord. Also put the Urim and the Thummim in the breast piece so that they may be over Aaron's heart. Wherever, whenever he enters the presence of the Lord, thus Aaron will always bear the meanings of making decisions for the Israel over his heart before the Lord. They put the Urim and the Thummim. They would use these to determine a yes or a no from God. They would ask a question and they would use these. Have you ever asked a question of God? God, what do I do about this? What do I do about that? These questions are coming from your heart and they're a longing from your heart. And that's where we need to keep those decision making happen, happening. Where does Jesus want to live and abide? His word says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man opens the door, I will come in and sup with him and him with me. Jesus wants to come into your heart and he wants to rule and reign from there. What is he going to speak to you? He's going to speak to you from, his, from your heart. He no longer dwells in a temple made of, of, of stone. He dwells within your heart. And when he speaks to you, he's going to speak to you from your heart. And he's going to be able to give you those decisions. But it needs to be covered over. It needs to be held righteous. And so guard your heart with all diligence. How do you guard your heart? You guard your eyes. You guard what you see. And you be cautious as to what you see. Because what you see, your heart will long after. And so if you guard your eyes, you guard your heart. And if you guard your heart, you guard your life. And so be cautious with the things that you look at, the things that you see, and the things that you put before you. And when you do, and when you start looking towards things that are right and righteous, it'll bless your life. Love you guys. Have a great day. I get the little ducklings. Wait, 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 wait.